morning, everyone. And a special shout out and good morning to David Loyley. It was a special shout out. And my friend John Vauder. Goodness. Good morning. It's good to see all of you here. It's good to have everyone happy, healthy, and uh, it's a little bit of pressure on me. <laughs> better, better make this good. We are back into the book of Romans. We're picking it up in chapter 13. Uh, the Holy Week has, has come and gone, and uh, although some of the songs still reflect uh, kind of a deep admiration and, and a worship towards God for what he's done for us in Christ, uh, we're, we're going to move on into chapter 13. Just uh, to highlight in chapter 13, verse 2, it says this, Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. It's one of those passages that makes everyone go, Ooh, that's right, that's right. The authority. If, if you remember when we're going through the book of Romans, the first 11 chapters are very theological. From 9 to 11, it talks about Israel. And we kind of walk with Paul through his gospel, if you will, from chapter 1 all the way to now. And we're now talking about the application part where the rubber meets the road because of all of the things in the previous 11 chapters and, and even into chapter 12 how should we then behave as Christians? Being that we've committed our life to Jesus Christ, that we are followers of Jesus, uh, not just recipients of a great gift, but also those who are disciples of Jesus Christ, how should we live? So we're in 13. If you remember in chapter 12, it begins by, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service or your reasonable service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So basically, I broke it down to three things. Number one, you have to decide to die. It's not about you. Your life is not about you because you were created by God for himself. So hold a funeral for yourself. Don't you wish you could have a real funeral for yourself? You wish you could be there and actually see people weeping because you're gone. You're not that insecure? <laughs> so the first thing we do is we die to ourselves. The second thing that we do is we resist conformity because the world wants to press us into its mold so that we look like, talk like, and act like everyone out there. Uh, and most people want to be accepted on the basis of whatever evil thing it is that they do, and they want you to approve of it. Well, that's not something that we can do. It's not something that will follow as an example either. And the third thing that you need to do is you need to transform by the renewing of your mind. So we have to reform the way we think. We have to change the way we look at things. We don't look at things like the world does. We look at things like God does because that's the truth. And so we need a brainwashing. I mean, we need to scrub our brains and make sure we don't put any more of those junky things into it that uh, we have in the past. Amen? Amen. I don't know if, if you're like me, but I grew up saying certain things to myself and believing them and just assuming them. And unfortunately, the scriptures tell me the truth and my life doesn't always line up. And so I have to make sure that I change the way I think. If I don't change the way I think, I certainly can't change the way I feel and I certainly won't change the way I behave. But it all starts with the way that you think. So you can, I mean, I can go out to my car and find a flat tire, and I can curse and kick the, kick the rim, and I can be all freaked out. It's because I expect the car to be in perfect condition when I come out. But see, every time I park it somewhere and I walk in somewhere, I just figure I may never see it again. And then when I go out and it's there and it runs, I'm so thrilled. So that's the secret to being thankful. Just say goodbye to everything and everyone. 
Because you don't know who you're going to see next or who you won't see next. Just treat it like it's your last interaction. And do you want it to be well or do you want it, you want it to be like, Ugh. and oh, I just saw them yesterday. I totally mixed them off. Yeah, you don't want to do that. So we have to change the way that we think. And by changing the way we think, we change the way we feel about things. So when somebody comes and smacks you on the face, you don't go. Those emotions rise quickly, don't they? But that comes from our old thinking patterns, our old thinking patterns. So if I go out and I kick the tire in my car, you know that my thinking pattern's not on. It's off. So we've talked about this in chapter 12, and now we're moving on to chapter 13, which talks about submission to government authorities. A great silence was heard that day. <laughs> it was deafening. We're going to see how it is for a Christian to behave toward the government, not just the federal government, but the state government, the local government, the IRS. Yeah, we got some people bristling. Okay. <laughs> Romans chapter 13. I'm just taking seven verses. You're welcome. <laughs> Verse 1. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Everybody say yes. 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 Good. Yes. Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who pr practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due Taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to those whom customs are due, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. It might be a little difficult to swallow that Christians who are not of this world, who are foreigners here in this world, should submit to this world's framework. Even though we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind and not pressed into its mold, we still have to live in the system and we submit to earthly authorities because they are given by God. Well, if you're a student of history or if you've ever watched TV, you might struggle with this entire point. And so you should. We are people who believe in resisting. We as Americans are known for being rebellious. Did you know that? Yes. What are you looking at? Yeah, and, and so in Jersey as well. We are known as being rebellious. And if you say something, what you might get is something contrary from the person you're talking to. Do you know what I'm talking about? I grew up believing America was great because we resisted the power. We didn't let England tell us what to do. We're our own country. Taking money from us and not letting us have a say in our government. So I don't know about you, but that tends to feed a fire in me. How about you? Yes. Or somebody, all somebody has to do is come up and tell me to do something. <laughs> hey, Dave, what you need to do, hold on, rephrase. <laughs> don't tell me what I need to do. Because you've just taken authority over me and I just, I'm your puppet now, right? I'm very sensitive to words because it's kind of what I do here. And so I have this heart to resist. You're going to tell me what to do. 
Pastor, you know what you should do? I mean, do you, do you have that? It's called a sinful nature. It's a desire to be rebellious and not have anybody tell you what to do. If you have a boss and your boss tells you what to do, there's a way to do that. And Jesus tells us. But it goes against our sinful nature and it goes against a lot of the things in which I have been brought up to think this is what it is to be a man. It's to resist. Don't let anybody tell you anything. Tell, I'll tell you. Tell me. I'm going <laughs> to... Take your head off. You know, it's, uh, we resist, we insist, we persist, and this is our thing. And this is the sinful nature of a human being is to do that. It's not to respond in kindness or in love. It's to resist because not everything is good. Now, if you live, uh, if you know anything about uh, who Mr. Leary is here, Timothy Leary, he says, to think for yourself, you must question authority. How many of you have seen the bumper stickers, question authority? None of you. Okay, maybe you have one. Okay, that's a <laughs> question authority. It's, a, it's an interesting thing. Uh, he, he believed in taking LSD to open his mind, so, you know, you get what you pay for. But um, <laughs> Timothy Leary, very well educated, uh, actually brought up in a church, uh, went to Harvard, graduated, did exceptionally well, and then got into LSD and told everybody they should drop acid and, you know, punch out of life. So mind expanding things. Well, he was a symbol in the 1960s of rebellion, of just resisting and not submitting. If you remember when credit cards came out, the world said, you know, you can trust a credit card. A credit card, plastic money is the way to go because you spend and you feel no pain. Maybe you'll get a letter. Maybe you won't. Maybe what you just bought is free because it was on plastic. <laughs> you can trust plastic. I remember when ATMs first came out. I said, this is a conspiracy. <laughs> first of all, it's putting human beings out of a job. And second of all, they were free. You could just come up freely. I mean, I know they paid a lot of money for those machines. Just come up freely. Now, unless it's at your bank... You're paying. I knew it. <laughs> I don't ever go to an ATM. I have no use for them. You can have them all. As far as I'm concerned, you can scrap them all. Take the money out, though. Question authority, but not your mother. You may have heard your mother say that. You can question authority. Don't question your mother. It's amazing how we have a long track record in our lives of just rebelling against any kind of authority doesn't matter whether it's actually real or you know, imagined, we tend to have a problem. And now, we, we at least recently had a White House that was full of soldiers because there was this deep concern that a bunch of unarmed people would visit the White House again and try to take over the government. You're told to trust the government by the people who are in power. You're told to question authority by those who are not. So everybody who's now a Democrat, I guess they have to take the bumper sticker off that says question authority because they got their guy in. Well, that's the way life is. So organized revolution. It's funny, you'll never find that anywhere in the Bible. You need to organize revolution and strike back. Give it to the man. You'll never find that in the scripture. What you find is chapter 13 in the book of Romans which is a very different thing. It's interesting, in the 1960s, there were people that said question authority, and then when they got older, suddenly you question anyone who questions authority. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting procession as people get older. You know, when you're younger and you have no authority and everyone seems to be telling you what to do, it's this question authority, man, you know, who are you telling me? And then when you get older, it's like, I don't trust anybody who questions authority. You're all a bunch of rebels. That's how you can tell if you're old. How many of you are old? Yeah, because you possess some degree of authority. That's what it is. Here's an interesting statement from George Orwell. He wrote in his book, 1984, power is not a means, it is an end. One does not establish a dictatorship in order to safeguard a revolution. One makes a revolution in order to establish a dictatorship. 
when you see a whole bunch of people that get all excited and angry and, and start trying to overthrow a government, what they're trying to institute is a dictatorship, not freedom. It's an interesting thing. All the people that say question authority want to take authority. Once they take authority, if anyone says question authority, you're their enemy. Isn't it interesting? The scripture doesn't get into any of that. Benjamin Franklin said, the first responsibility of every citizen is to question authority. In fact, that's why the government provides for us to own guns. By the way, it's not to have a militia. It's that people would have guns so you could defend yourself against the government. That was the intention of the forefathers that wrote the Constitution. It's not that we would have a well-formed militia and, and, and the government would have all of the guns. That's not what our founding fathers had in mind. What they said is all the people should have weapons so that they can defend themselves against the government. So it's a very different thing when you start talking about authority and who's got the power and who's in charge. The Bible has a very different take on it. In fact, the very question itself, question authority, begs, who says so? Question authority, who are you telling me what to do? You know? The very question itself supposes you have authority to ask such a question, right? Can you imagine a teacher or a professor in a college saying, you should question authority? And the person in the audience, one of the students paying for that education says, oh yeah, who says? The teacher in the front of the room says. And the teacher is telling you to question authority. Do you see the cyclical insanity of this thing? And yet, we're not to be that way. And of course, it depends on whose quip you're taking and listening to. Thomas Jefferson said, when the people fear the government, there is tyranny. When the government fears the people, there is liberty. Interesting. Barack Obama said, they'll warn that tyranny is always lurking just around the corner. You should reject those voices. These are two leaders of our country at two different times of, of, of time. Interesting, isn't it? It's very interesting. And so stay home, be afraid, wear a mask, stay six feet away. There are things that you can do and that you can't do. Boy, we're all living in that world, aren't we? So what do we do with authority? Romans, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, through Paul the Apostle, says, let every soul be subject, that means to submit, to the governing authorities. How many of you don't like that passage? Okay. It, it does not sit naturally with us because some of those governing authorities are pretty rotten to the core. I've heard more than one person talk about our governor, our president, and a multitude of others. I've even heard you talk about your pastor. I pre-forgive you all. It's okay. Let every soul be subject to governing authorities. That has a period. That is a statement. That is the deal. For there is no authority except from God. Do you realize God could change anybody at any time? Amen. And he does, by the way, according to Scripture. Amen. Just like he can change the course of a mighty river, he can change out a person. He's the one who raises kings up and brings them down. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Now, how many of you have a philosophical question? <laughs> Thank you, John Vauder. Even... Hitler, let's take it to its extreme. I'll get back to that. Thank you for asking. He was writing this to a people in Rome who were under the subjugation of the Roman government. He's writing to believers in Rome who at this point is under Nero. Nero was a sick ticket. 
Nero would take Christians, hang them on crosses in his garden, strap them up, put pitch on them, set them on fire, and ride naked through his gardens, saying, look, they are the light of the world. You know, the guy that supposedly fiddled while Rome burned. Submit to the governing authorities, even Nero, who might put you in one of his circuses. They would have what they called a circus. They would put you in an amphitheater, all the Christians, and some lions. And it was sport to watch the Christians get shredded up. Unless you recanted and you burned incense to Caesar as though he were God and then you were off the hook. So you see, you could denounce Jesus Christ and live. Or if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and Messiah and you bowed to no one else, you get killed. That is the history that we live with. And yes, he really did this. And I, I looked it up. It's not just a rumor. He, <laughs> Rome burned he wasn't even there when Rome burned, by the way. And there was no such thing as a fiddle until the 14th century, just so you know. He didn't set the fire. It was always, no, sorry. Billy Joel in my head. Nero was the guy who took Peter and hung him on a cross. And he was upside down. And that's how Peter died. Peter insisted on being upside down because he did not think that he was worthy to die like his Lord. So Nero is a sick ticket, and the scripture is saying, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, even Nero. So if you think you got a loophole, you can get out of it, or the scripture doesn't mean what it really means, think of it in its context, because they think it's important. And then, of course, Paul goes before Nero when he ended up going to Rome, and he was the one who was actually able to share the gospel and tell him about it. And that may have been the thing that inspired Nero to freak out on Christians because it was just after Paul's encounter with him that all of this began. And so here's Paul stating his case before Nero and telling him about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and Nero then goes off. And you know, it's not unusual for people to be confronted with the gospel when they say no, that they go off. Just so you don't think this is the only place in the scripture it says this, in Titus 3, 1 to 8, it says, remind them, meaning the people of God, to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, that means toward the government, to speak evil of no one, in context of the rulers and authorities, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. In context, it means to all rulers, police officers, governor. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But, and this should be the case for everyone here, when the kindness and the love of our God, our Savior, toward man appeared, toward man, by the way, that's universal, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these are things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Notice how that last verse is tying in with the first verse. He's talking about doing a good work and it's profitable towards men. He's speaking about in context of how we as Christians interact with our governing authorities, which starts with your boss, starts with your mortgage company. It's, it's, it's everybody that has authority over you. That's how we're to be. That's how we're to treat them. Speak evil of no one. That's when I should get tattooed on my forehead and I should see it every morning backwards in the mirror. 
because if people, all people did this, we'd have no news. <laughs> There'd be nothing on TV to talk about. So-and-so checked into a rehab today. Like, is that, is that really necessary? We need to know about that. Speak evil of no man. It's pretty simple. Verse 2, therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Do you know when God ordained government? Right after Noah's Ark. You know what he said? I love a captive audience. This is wonderful. I'll tell you later. <laughs> we wrestle with these things. It reminds me of when, when Jacob was wrestling with the Lord. And uh, when you're wrestling with the Lord, it's best to hold on, by the way. Uh, you don't want to let go because that'll be the end. But we wrestle with these things and we certainly wrestle with God when we do that and we don't submit to authorities. And we bring judgment upon ourselves. And so don't be surprised if your disobedience to the law ends up in your jail time or your punishment or a fine. You, you take a risk because you live in a system where it's designed to do that. It says in Matthew 44 to 45 in chapter 5, but I say to you, Jesus said, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. See, God is universally good. That's his prevenient grace, which is on everyone. He doesn't just rain on your field, and the other person's field is dry as a bone. He rains on everybody's field. It gives everyone an equal opportunity at his grace. And I'm so glad for that. That's the way God treats people. That's the way we should treat people. Not because you're my friend and you're my buddy and, you know, you do me a favor, so I'm going to treat you nice. Everybody else, I got no time for them. That's not how we're to be. So, verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. It's interesting. He's the minister. You know, some people call me a minister. Did you know that the police are your ministers? They're God's ministers. I wonder if you call them father, if that would be... No, I probably want to do that. <laughs> I'm not sure if you shared one. If you shared that with one of them when they pull you over, I'm not sure it would be accepted well. But for you to get a chance to say thank you and I appreciate what you do, that would be a good thing to do because, you know, it's a very difficult job. I had thought about going into um, law enforcement never. <laughs> and my wife is happy because you get shot and you have a high likelihood of being shot at and you're despised just for wearing a uniform. So I never thought of doing that, ever. But they do lots of good. Can you imagine the world without police officers? Can you imagine the world without trash pickup? I know Karen can. She's been to Haiti. They don't have trash pickup. Whatever trash you produce on property, you have to deal with. You can burn it or you can throw it on the side of the road right next to the trough that you drink from, which a lot of people do. Can you imagine not having paved roads, stoplights, lights on the road at night? Can you imagine not having all of this, a, a police officer ready at a phone call? Courts who settle things, all of these things that our taxes go to pay for, all these people who are in authority. You might not like everything that they do, but you have to respect the position. And they do all kinds of things, and some of them are, are some of the best people you'd ever want to see. And they become villainized when one person is bad. It's like when one Christian preacher does something stupid and goes off the rail, suddenly all of Christianity has to wear the shame of that. And that's, that's a terrible tragedy. 
But police are always busy making connections with the neighborhood, and it should be that way. You should know a cop, <laughs> you know, and especially if you need them. But there are stories, I've read tons of stories, and I don't want to go through them all with you, of police officers. This, this guy in the bottom gave his boots to this homeless guy uh, in New York City. And there are all of these things. I mean, there are police officers that, that shoveled snow because somebody was stuck and couldn't get out and had to go to a hospital. Um, I had a picture of a police officer who actually mowed somebody's lawn. I mean, all of, all of these things, these guys are usually wonderful servants. Not every one of them is perfect, uh, you know, whether they're police women or police men or whether they're in security. Certainly all human beings don't have a kind heart. But, you know, you have to have some kind of an understanding of what it is to serve and protect if you're going to take the job. They should be appreciated. And when people cry out to defund the police, I think they're the first ones that their phone calls should be ignored. Oh, you have a fire in your house. Sorry. We'll get there when we get a chance. Maybe. Why don't you check your neighbor? Maybe your neighbor will take care of you. Don't you have a relative? Don't you have a friend? Don't you have a hose at your house? Take care of it yourself. What's the matter with you? And we take these things for granted. And we feel that we have a right to speak evil of people who have authority when we don't agree with them, and yet you need them. And it's a tremendous, tremendous privilege. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Abraham Lincoln, if you look for the bad in mankind expecting to find it, you surely will. You know where that quote's from? Abraham Lincoln, thank you very much, yes. <laughs> I'm just seeing if you're paying attention. Actually, it comes from a movie called Pollyanna, which is one of my favorite movies, and I, I've talked to you about it. it. She has it on a locket, and this preacher actually has to read it and because that's where he is. He's looking for the evil in people, and he finds it all the time, and she teaches him about the glad game. Um, good, good family viewing, except for the naked guy in the very beginning there's a little boy, he's naked and he's skinny dipping and he swings into the water. So you could fast forward through that part. But anyway, <laughs> so this is actually from the movie and it's attributed to Abraham Lincoln. Don't believe everything you read on the internet just because there's a picture with a quote next to it. <laughs> because I tried to verify that Abraham Lincoln wrote this and where he wrote it and I can't find it anywhere. The problems with quotes on the internet is that no one can confirm their authenticity. <laughs> and there's, there's Honest Abe with the telephone. He's taking a picture of you this morning. So just be careful when you do your research that you don't stumble on something that you think is real and it's not real just because there's somebody picture next to it and somebody created a quote. And there are all sorts of reliable places I've gone and they all attribute this to him. And I have not found it anywhere. In fact, that's one of those Snopes things. Abraham Lincoln never said that. Or if he did, at least there's no record of it. But I think it's a good saying nonetheless uh, from the movie Pollyanna. If you look for the bad in mankind expecting to find it, you surely will. And if you put on a critical heart, you'll be a critical person. And you'll find tons of things to talk about. But that's the opposite of being thankful. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. By the way, you know what they do with the sword? In Rome, they cut your head off. It's not just a euphemistic parable of the ability to enforce the law. He's talking about a real sword with a real sharp blade on it that will sever your head from your body. That's what he's saying. They do not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister, an avenger. I was going to put an avenger up there. I didn't. To execute wrath on him who practices evil. That is the purpose of government is to punish people who are evildoers. Do they do it perfectly? No, because humans aren't perfect. But can you imagine not having the system? No law enforcement. You can go anywhere, do anything you want to do. No consequences, no accountability, no jail time. It's a problem. And yet, 
I don't know about you, but our men and women in uniform specifically are taking a lot of heat. We should be praying for them, supporting them and encouraging them because they have a really difficult job to do. Imagine no prisons. It's easy if you try. <laughs> no one to punish or incarcerate. It'll make you thankful. In Genesis 9, 5 to 6, it says this, For surely your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning, and the hand of every beast I will require it, and from the hand of man. From the hand of every man's brother I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. This is the first ordinance of God in establishing law. He says, if someone murders, they forfeit their life. I'm not talking about killing. There's a difference between killing and murdering. If somebody is a murderer, you intentionally take someone's life, you forfeit your life. Well, not in this country. But do you know, Islam is extremely popular in England. And a lot of people are converting over to Islam. You know why? Because they don't mess around. You get caught stealing, you lose your hand. You get caught committing adultery, you get stoned. You get your head cut off. They seriously, seriously hold to the law. And that's very attractive to a nation that's gone awry and there's no sense of law. So it becomes very, very attractive. When you take the death penalty off the table, you don't discourage people from killing. You know, I'll spend a few years in the joint, I'll get an education, watch a lot of TV, play basketball on a nice new wooden floor, and you know, when I get out, I'll be a little older, but you know, maybe I'll have an education, maybe I'll have my degree, maybe I could be a lawyer. And that's what we do with murderers. The scripture says, if you forfeit a life, you forfeit yours, period. Which brings up abortion. Because God made people in his image. God is serious about defending his image. Just like he is about his name. That's why you don't take his name in vain. Verse 5, therefore you must be subject or submissive, not only because of wrath, because there's punishment if you don't listen, but because of conscience sake. Stephen Wright says a clear conscience is usually the sign of a bad memory. <laughs> but a clear conscience makes for a soft pillow, makes for easy sleeping, because you don't have to worry about what you've done and worry about somebody sneaking up on you and taking retribution. Your conscience. So we do what's right, not just because we don't get punished, but we do what's right because we live our lives before God and we want to do what's right. In fact, the golden rule of what Jesus told us to do is to love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. In these two hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus boiled it down to just those two and if you had to boil it down to one, it would be love. Be love, the most important thing that Jesus said to do. And so you want to be sensitive to your conscience. Your, your conscience will tell you that you should be doing something when you actually want to do something else. The Spirit of God is that which quickens our conscience. And then it becomes a nuclear-powered conscience to the place where the Spirit of God speaks to our heart and tells us what we should and should not be doing. And that all happens as we reformat our brains, as we get our, our brains on track with what God would have us to do. We don't think like the world and we don't think that we can get away with things. And the more that you know, the more that we're held accountable to, right? And so that, that kind of tug of war between the brain and the heart we, we, that we all experience, um, we have to be careful because it's the man in the mirror that we have to pay attention to, right? It's, it's the one that we have to stand before God and give an account of because I'm not going to give an account necessarily for everything that you do in your life, but I'll have to give an account for what I do in my life. You don't have to give an account for me. And that's good for you because I got a list. Verse six, for because of this, you also pay taxes. 
yay, taxes, for they are God's ministers. The IRS is God's minister? Come on, pastor, you got to be kidding me. No, no, it's here, right here. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. And by the way, they attend continually to that very thing. <laughs> they will catch up with you. You'll get a letter and you will be expected uh, to pay. Anyway, taxes. Do you know where your taxes go? I don't know about you, but I'm, I just usually say, okay, 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 okay. I don't want to give them a penny more than what they want or what they're due. And there is a difference between avoidance and evasion. Just thought I'd let you know. You can avoid paying taxes or you can evade taxes. If you evade taxes and you get caught, you're going to have to pay. But this is where it goes, actually. A huge chunk of your income is dedicated to taxes. The average family paid more than $12,000 in federal income tax last year. Does that surprise any of you? No, because you're paying right around that or more, right? So I get it. That's federal income tax. It goes to health programs. It goes to the military. And aren't you glad we don't have anybody they want marching over on our shores? Social Security, veterans benefits, food and agricultural benefits like the CHIP program, education programs like Pell Grants and uh, education. So this is where most of your tax dollars go, and they go somewhere else. Do you know that over a billion dollars a year, there are taxpayers who don't claim their refund and it should be in their pocket? And after three years, the federal government gets to decide what to do with it. So if you've left some money there, you should really pick it up. Because a billion dollars is a lot of money. Number one thing, actually, that goes your taxes go to is the deficit. Does that surprise any of you? The number one thing that your taxes go to is the deficit, uh, which is the money that we owe. The United States government borrowed more than $900 billion in 2019 alone. And you can bet the total debt is high. At the end of 2019, it was $22.8 trillion with, with a T. That's like a lot of commas. According to the Peter P G. Peterson Foundation, which keeps daily national debt clock, as of February 24th, 2021, the national debt was that big number? More than $27.9 trillion. Check this out. Not sure exactly how much that really is. Well, consider this. As everyone in the United States covered an equal portion of the debt, each person would need to pony up $84,000.29. Feel a little hopeless? I feel like the government needs my money more than ever. Not surprising, a large chunk of that federal government goes to the debt. But in 2019, around 8% of federal spending covered only the interest on the debt. So this money is constantly making money for someone else, and we're, we're hardly able to keep up with the interest payments. Something's got to happen. So it makes me complain less. It makes me want to vote more. Your state taxes. Your state taxes are divided up like this. Education is 26% or so. Uh, Medicaid, children's health programs are 17. Higher education is 15%. Corrections, only 5%. Public assistance is 1%. Transportation is 6%. And other is 32, which is like a trillion other things that are in those. I spared you showing you that piece of the pie. These are what your state taxes go to, and it's, it's more uh, roads and local things and trash pickup and schools and all of that kind of thing. So something I feel a little better about giving to because it's not as big a number, and I actually get to see the benefits of it. So it says that we should pay taxes. It says in verse 7, render therefore to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. So revenue, reverence, and respect, those are the three things that it talks about. Those three things are things that we should owe the government and those who are in authority. If you remember, Jesus was asked the question, they said, Rabbi, we know, you know that you're, you're awesome because you don't give a rip about anybody. It's the Jersey version. 
you don't care what anybody thinks. And you answer in truth. And then they ask the question, because, you, you know, Jesus could see them buttering them up. Taxes to Caesar, should we pay them? That's right. Tell us, therefore, what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? Okay, this is, this is a government came in and took over Israel. This isn't the natural citizens. But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why do you test me, you hypocrites? I love that. <laughs> Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. It's interesting that the guys who were asking him, should we pay taxes, happened to have cash in their pocket with Caesar's face on it. So apparently they have no problem dealing with Rome because they're using Roman money. You hypocrites, that's why you call them hypocrites. Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. He said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Amen. What a great recap. Then they had heard these words, they marveled and they left him and they went away. Listen, why do you have such a hard time parting with your money? Well, because do you know what they do with that money, Pastor? I mean, they're funding abortions, they're funding wars in other countries, they're, you know, funding all sorts of things. Well, what do you think Nero was funding? Everybody and their brother was having an abortion, by the way. Almost half of all Rome were slaves. And Nero built himself a giant palace that was entirely gilded with gold so that he could have raucous flesh parties. This was right after the fire, of course, conveniently taking out neighborhoods that he needed to build on. Give to Caesar that which is Caesar's. Because the image of Caesar's is on the money, right? And it begs the question, whose image is on you? It says, God created man in his own image. Male and female, he created them. So what should we render unto God? Everything. Because we're his. His image is upon us. There is an exception. I know some of you are sighing and saying, thank God pastor's going to talk about that. <laughs> there is a loophole. If you remember Daniel, he was told not to pray by Nebuchadnezzar. And he disregarded the government's authority because it conflicted with God's authority because God's authority is bigger. If somebody's going to tell me to do something that's going to violate God's law, and you better have a scripture, not some general feeling. Because what they ended up doing was throw him in a lion's den to be devoured and God preserved him because he stood up. He did it in a respectful fashion. He wasn't like, let's all get together, let's march, and let's wreck things. Individually, he stood up. You'd never find in the scripture a bunch of people getting together and trying to overthrow a government. Right. Doesn't happen. You turn the other cheek, you go the second mile. You give to him who despitefully uses you, and you pray for those. That's what the scripture teaches. If you happen to be Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they tell you to bow down and worship a giant golden statue of Nebuchadnezzar, if you read the story in Daniel, they were so respectful. They say, we will not bow down. Even if you kill us, we're not going to bow down. Our God's able to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow. They didn't say, you know, they did it very respectfully. And they did the right thing. Of course, they were thrown in the furnace for it, but they made a friend. <laughs> if you remember Peter and John, they go to the temple to pray, and there's a man laying there, and he's lame. And he, he puts his hand out for money not making eye contact, and they say, well, silver and gold, we have none, but what we have, we give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise and walk. And the guy rises and walks. 
And they all walk into the temple together, this dirty beggar that was left at the door that people would throw change to. Now he's coming in where all these people that had to pass him are. And they're like, what in the world happened here? Well, they got in deep trouble for that, and they had to go before the Sanhedrin and have to give an explanation as to what is this all about. And you were speaking in the name of Jesus, the one that was crucified, the one that we put forward and got permission from Pilate to kill him. Don't do that. We look bad. It's essentially what he said. From Acts chapter 4, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel. Notice how he addresses them with respect. If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all that to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, you know he's ruffling feathers, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders. He's quoting the Old Testament on him. Which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Amen. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. They marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves saying, what shall we do with these men? For indeed, a notable miracle has been done through them. It's evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. We cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severe, severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. And so they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you be the judge. Notice how respectful that was put. He could have, you know, he could have been from California and said, no way, dude. <laughs> For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people since they were all glorified God for what had been done. And the man was over 40 years old in whom the miracle of healing had been performed. Bottom line, guys, if earthly authorities want you to do something, you, as far as it lies within you, you live at peace with all men. You do what you can. If they're asking you to violate one of God's laws, don't do it. But do it in a respectful fashion. Remember, we're Christians. We bear the name Christ. He was hung on a cross for things he didn't do. He was accused of things that he never did. He was punished for the things that you and I have done. And he, like a lamb is before or shearers is dumb, and so he opened not his mouth. That requires walking in the spirit. You can't do that in the flesh. In the flesh, we just want to argue with everybody. But if you're a servant of God, you don't do that. Romans 13. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister, an avenger, to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. They are God's ministers, attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom is fear and honor, 
to whom is honor. God deserves everything that we have, and the reflection of our Christian life is seen in the way that we handle people in authority. One time we were having a leadership meeting in, in the office, and I asked all of the men who were gathered there, how many of you come from church where you had an authority problem? They all raised their hand, including me. You know what that told me? I'm not alone. <laughs> and you're not alone. But consider being obedient to the scriptures in this point. Does it not radiate and smell like the presence of Christ? The beauty and the love of our God where you trust that God is going to take care of you. You don't need to take vengeance for yourself. You don't need to defend yourself. Just do what God calls you to do. Now, if your husband tells you that you should be a prostitute to make money, you can tell him no, even though you submit to him like you would submit to the Lord, the scripture says. If I'm going to tell my wife, my boss is going to call, just tell him I'm sick. Yeah, but you're not sick. Yeah, that's right. Just tell him I'm sick. What do you do then? What do you do when your boss tells you to do something dishonest? I worked for a very lo large uh, retailer of building materials. It's fairly vague. <laughs> and we would take inventory. And when we took inventory, they said, walk into the bathroom. I said, okay. They said, how many toilets are in here? Five. Mark it down. How many faucets are in here? Five. Mark it down. How many urinals are in here? We don't even carry urinals. Mark it down. How many pieces of tile are on the floor? How many lights are in the ceiling? Inflating numbers. So it looks like they had more inventory than they did. So the boss didn't look like a schmuck because he let a bunch of stuff go out the back door and out the front door and let people pocket stuff and take it. These are very serious questions that we end up getting stuck in, and I would advise you that you get on your knees and ask the Lord about it. The scripture is pretty clear, and hopefully I'm, I rest easy knowing that you're well taught, at least in these seven verses. And yet, God's law is higher than man's law. We have an obligation to live for him before we live for anyone else. Amen? Amen. Amen.